Good morning, church. It is a real honor to be with you again. Um, I was here about a month ago. If I didn't meet you then, my name's Chris Mormon. I'm the lead pastor of a, a church in downtown Washington, D.C., called Grace Capital City, and we are honored to be a, a partner church here. That we, Our church is five years old, and, and we have been um, fortunate enough to be supported and loved well by this fellowship here at First Baptist. And so just really grateful uh, for the partnership and the friendship of this church. And um, while this is a really heavy Sunday for this church, I'm, I'm grateful to be here um, to be with you during it, and just wanted to echo the words that Pastor Wayne just shared, just what a beautiful thing it is that even in the midst of what you guys are praying through and what we're thinking through and partnering with Roger and his family in, um, that you have a, a team of worship leaders who would stand up and, and declare the goodness of Jesus, Right? Because it's one thing to praise God on the mountain, isn't it? And it's another thing to worship God when we walk through a valley. And you guys have an amazing team here. I mean, all of this choir and the production team and the leaders, I mean, they've had to steal themselves and say, say, no, the church of God, we gather, we worship, and we're going to declare God's goodness. And uh, I was reminded this morning of, of Psalm 121, it's a, one of the Psalms of David where he says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And, you know, the beauty of that Psalm is that when we lift our eyes to Jesus, when we lift our eyes to our help, it's, it's not that we disregard or forget what is going on on the ground, right? This isn't about being ignorant to what this church family is walking through right now, but it's reminding ourselves that our help, our breath, our days, everything is the grace of God, isn't it? And that He sustains us, and that He heals us, and that He restores us, and He who has been faithful in the past will be faithful again. And so I'm just, I'm just grateful to be at a church that has a, 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 a ministry of worshipers who said, and we will declare that. And so could we just show honor even to that team this morning, just for their faithfulness and to the leadership. It is, of course, as well, as, as, as Wayne mentioned, a, a special Sunday in the Christian calendar. It's what we call Palm Sunday, um, the triumphal entry it's a celebration in a lot of ways, although in a lot of ways it's a, it's a strange celebration because it's a celebration that very quickly takes a sour turn in the life of Jesus. But it is an important moment in Holy Week where we, where we remember and we celebrate the journey of Jesus to the cross and the resurrection. And so just honored to be able to speak into that a little bit this morning. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 11. And I want to read just the first 11 verses, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. And they went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. 
So I, I wonder if you could visualize this scene for me a little bit, because this is a really important context to understanding what is going on here. This is Jesus making the journey to Jerusalem for the final time, right? Jesus knows what is to come. He is journeying to Jerusalem. He's not making the journey alone because this is the time of Passover. And one of the traditions of the Hebrew people is that they would journey from wherever they are. They would find their way back to Jerusalem. It was a, a holy pilgrimage of sorts. And so you could imagine there would be Jewish people coming from all different regions, centering themselves to be back in, be back in Jerusalem for this festival of the Passover. Jesus journey specifically is a journey from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's a approximately a 15 mile journey. And because of the geography of Jericho, which is actually one of the, the lowest elevation cities in the entire world, it's, it's, it's located just near the Dead Sea. It's a very low city. Because of that elevation, it is a journey almost entirely uphill. So you can, you can picture this, right? Jesus is journeying 15 miles, Jericho to Jerusalem. He's, he's journeying up the hill. It must have been, in a lot of ways, an exhausting journey, a tiring journey. He would have crested the hill and seen Jerusalem in front of him, knowing that his destiny lay before him in that city. But this particular Passover is not like any other Passover. There's a different kind of atmosphere in the area, different kind of buzz in the air. You see, because at this Passover festival, the rabbi Jesus has been ministering, and the rumors, the stories of Jesus have started to kind of filter out a little bit amongst the people. The people have heard the stories about this rabbi who is teaching some pretty radical sermons. He's They've heard the stories about this rabbi who perhaps, if you believe the stories, has healed a blind man and he's been able to see again. If you believe the stories, this rabbi raised the man Lazarus from the dead, right? And so there's this, this extra level of anticipation as people are coming into Jerusalem for Passover and this man Jesus is there and they're wondering, could this rabbi be the Messiah? Could this rabbi be the one that we have waited for? And, and you imagine this must have been forefront in their consciousness because at Passover, this is what the Jewish people are thinking about, right? You think about the context of Passover. Passover is when they would remember and celebrate their, their journey out of slavery in Egypt. They would remember that God has saved them before. He has delivered them. They would remember the plagues and Moses and the Red Sea. They would remember that God has delivered them. So there's this kind of almost historical lens that they're looking at it and saying, God has delivered us before. But it's not just a historical lens. It's a, it's a, it's a modern lens. It's a current lens because those people in that day are very much under oppression as well, right? They've been under Roman rule for the last 60 years. And so this idea of a Messiah, this idea of a Savior, of someone who could lead them just as Moses led them out of slavery generations before, someone who could lead them again out of their current oppression, they're asking this question, could Jesus be the one? And so in comes Jesus. And he's made the journey, the 15 miles uphill from Jericho to Jerusalem, and he, and he enters the city riding on a donkey, and, and the people, they begin to respond, right? This, 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 this upswelling of emotion and feeling, and they begin to, to, to throw their cloaks on the ground. They begin to cut off palm branches and, 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 and cover the whole road, which even that act in itself, this was a, this was a ritual or a ceremony reserved for royalty, right? If a, if a dignitary or a, a king or a ruler of some kind was coming into a city, you would cover the road so that their feet never have to touch the dust of the ground, right? And, and yet now they're doing it to Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem. And the upswelling of a feeling of emotion, of waiting for a Savior, it begins to just overflow. And, and they start yelling out, Hosanna, 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 
which means save us. Jesus, will you save us? Will you deliver us? And then verse 10, they yell, blessed is the coming king of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. Guys, they are taking the prophetic words of the psalmist, Psalm 118, and they're projecting them onto Jesus. And all through the means, the lens of asking this question, could this be the Savior? And so if, if we are to step back for a minute and just look at this whole scene, this whole context, the the atmosphere, the energy, the outpouring, the ceremony, the words they're saying, we would look at it and we would say, wow, they get it. They, They finally figured it out, right? I mean, the Israelites got it. They're receiving him as a savior. He's being treated as royalty, received as a king. This must be the moment where finally Jesus steps into his destiny. And then something something really interesting happens. Something that in a lot of ways feels almost unexpected. Um, And it's something that isn't recorded in Mark's gospel, but it is recorded in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 19, there's a verse here, Luke chapter 19, verse 41, this is Jesus, he's made his way into Jerusalem, and then it says something interesting, it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. As Jesus approaches the city, he begins to weep. Now, I, I don't know about you, but you can read that and you think, okay, this is, this is a celebration. Like, this is, this is the moment, right? He is being heralded as king. Finally, they, 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 they're, they're receiving him. Like, we would think this isn't a moment for weeping. This is a moment for rejoicing. Why is Jesus weeping? What does Jesus know that we don't know just in our flesh? What does Jesus see? And, and he, he alludes at it if you read the next verse in verse 42. Jesus begins to weep and he says, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. He looks at all the celebration, everything that's going on, and he says, If you had known what would bring you peace. And the implication that Jesus is making here is that you don't. You don't see it. It's right in front of your eyes, but you're going to miss it. You're blind to it. What would bring you peace is here, and yet you cannot receive it. And and Jesus begins to weep. You see, what Jesus knows is that despite all of the celebration and all of the fanfare and all of the rejoicing, that they still do not really understand who he is and that they still do not really understand what he has come to do. And that the same voices that are now shouting, Hosanna, 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 very shortly will be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And this is, it's interesting for us, but when we look at what the Jewish people were wanting in a Messiah, it starts to make sense a little bit. You see, like I was saying before, especially around Passover, when this was forefront in their consciousness, the Jewish people, they wanted a Messiah, but they wanted a very specific kind of Messiah, right? They, they wanted almost like a, like a warrior, militaristic kind of Messiah. They, they wanted someone who would remind them of David. King David was the, the famous king of Israel. And, and King David, he didn't take, he, he didn't take any, you know, any, any, any trash from their enemies. He got revenge on their enemies. He led Israel back to the top. He, he was the kind of king you could be proud of. And for the Israelites, when they were thinking about what kind of king they wanted, they wanted a king like that. They wanted a king who could lead them back to the top, who could defeat their enemies, who could drive out Rome and take Israel back to where they thought it should be. And so here, on the other hand, you have Jesus entering into the city and he enters in on a donkey. 
He enters in on a donkey. In fact, not just a donkey. Jesus rides into the city on the colt of a donkey, which means it was a baby donkey. Now, I, I, can, I don't know if you can visualize this scene for a minute. This must have looked really odd. We don't know if Jesus was a tall man necessarily in that region, probably not especially tall, but even for that day, like to ride in on this small donkey, like his feet very well may have been kind of dragging in the ground. Like if you could picture me, if I rode in to give my sermon this morning on a kid's tricycle, okay, six foot three and I hunched over and just rode my way, like that's the kind of scene we're talking about here, right? It must have looked different. It must have looked really, really odd that Jesus rode in on a donkey. But here's the thing. We know Jesus didn't just ride in on a donkey because it was the only animal available, right? He asked for the donkey. He didn't ask for a chariot. He didn't ask for a horse. He didn't ask for a procession. He said, bring me the donkey. That's what I want. I want the colt of a donkey because Jesus was asking for something very intentional for a very specific reason. The kings of Jesus' day, when they would enter a city would make a statement just in how they entered, right? So you think about the, the Persians and the Greeks and the Babylonians all throughout history, these powerful empires and kings throughout history, Alexander the Great and the, the Caesars of Rome, right? They, they would ride in and they would come into a city and the way they entered, riding a powerful white horse, would make a statement about their power. And you can imagine like these magnificent beasts they would ride in on these stallions, they're six foot tall and above. And of course, then if you're sitting on it, you would be even higher still. And you could look out over all the people and everyone could see the conquering king coming in on their magnificent white war horse, right? This was how kings of the day would enter into a city. Now, let's contrast for a minute. You have the kings of the day entering in on a white war horse, almost the exact opposite of that. As different as you could get comes Jesus entering in on the donkey. The lowly, humble donkey. Jesus is very specifically saying, I am not going to enter this city on a white war horse like the kings of the day. I am entering in on the cult of of a donkey. Why is Jesus doing this? Why is he so specific on the kind of animal that he would ride in? And I'll tell you what he's doing here. He is showing them the kind of king that he is. And he is showing them the kind of kingdom that he has come to establish. And he is in this, in this visual illustration of the, the, the animal that he rides into the city. He is showing them once and for all, I am not a king like you've seen before. And I am establishing a kingdom unlike you've experienced ever before. My kingdom is not like the kingdom of the Romans. And my kingdom is not like the kingdom of the, the Babylonians under which you were, you were oppressed for generations. My kingdom is not like the kingdom of any other kingdom before. And I am not a king like you've experienced before. You can see it represented just in the way I am riding into this city. My kingdom is different and it is not what you expected. And then he gets into Jerusalem making this statement and he begins to weep. And he weeps because he knows that they cannot truly receive him the way he has come to be. That he, they cannot really receive what he has come to establish. And that he has revealed himself as the prince of peace, but really what they wanted him to be was the god of war. And that while you may say, their shouts of Hosanna were an acclamation of faith. In a lot of ways, really, their shouts of Hosanna were a declaration of war. When will you come and take revenge on our enemies? When will you come and lead us out of this? When will you come and take us back to the top? And Jesus weeps. 
because he knows they cannot receive him as the king he has really come to be. I was um, here a month or so ago, and I told you guys just a little bit about my family. I have uh, two boys. I have a a seven-year-old and a nine-month-old, so life is full and life is busy. My seven-year-old is enrolled in a a D.C. public school, so pray for us, okay? Um, We we are grateful, but it's it's a great little school, and one of my jobs as a father is I do the the drop-off and pick-up. That's just kind of the way our schedules work out, and I do a lot of the drop-off and pick-up. And one thing I've learned doing pickup at this particular school is it is a very harrowing experience, okay? It is a slightly traumatic experience depending on the day. Um, and, and some of the reason it's so traumatic is just, just the layout. Um, I mean, most of you guys have spent a lot of time in D.C. and you know some of these D.C. roads are narrow. The, the road that my son's school on is very narrow. There's almost always cars parked on both sides either way. And at 3.45 p.m. on every school day, every mom and dad in that area converges in the same spot with a vision and a mission to get their child as quickly as they can and get out of there, right? And I, I kid you not, guys, it's like the wild, wild west. Like, it gets, it, it gets crazy. My mind has been blown at the things that will happen on these pickup mornings. Like, you have pickup afternoons, sorry. You, you'll have people shaking their fists and beeping their horns and just yelling stuff that we would never repeat in a church. And it just, it just gets really, really tense. So, anyway, this one particular day, a couple of weeks ago, I was coming to pick up my son. And I noticed that there is a a big line of cars coming out the street, which is not super uncommon, but I can see in the distance that a tractor trailer has decided to try and drive down the street right at the moment that pickup is happening in this school, okay? So clearly this driver had not done his research. (laughs) Clearly this guy did not know what he was taking on because, I mean, some days you can barely get a car down that road, let alone a tractor trailer. But this tractor trailer, he was making his way down that road. And so on one end, you got the tractor trailer. On another end, you got this whole army of moms and dads trying to get their way up the street and no one was moving. Like it was was getting very, very tense. So finally... um, a few of the cars, we start backing up and parking other places, and, and I'm like, back up my car, I went and parked on a street somewhere else, and I walked over, which in hindsight, probably what I should have done in the first place. So I walk my way over, and now I'm just kind of a casual observer of this situation, and I realize that all the cars have backed up and gone and parked somewhere else, except three. And there are three cars at the front of the line, and they have decided they are not moving. Now, keep in mind, there is no way for this tractor trailer to back up. Like, you can't move this thing, and this driver is laying on the air horn, like the whole city of D.C. is just shaking every time he presses his horn. And the drivers are getting out of their car, and they're yelling, and they're yelling at each other. And people on the side are saying, just move your car. And they're like, no, we're not going to move the car. And it's going back and forth, and it's getting crazy. I mean, it must have been 20 minutes these people are here yelling at each other about who was going to move their car first. And so I'm on the sidewalk, and I'm looking at it, and this thought, <laughs> this one-word question popped into my mind about the whole situation. And the question was, why? <laughs> what are you possibly hoping to achieve in this situation? Like, you cannot win, all right? There is no way around this, and you have decided that you are willing to sacrifice 20 minutes of your day just to make sure you are the person who did not move their car. That's really what it came down to. I'm not moving my car, and I will stay here as long as it took. I will say, full context, they did eventually move their car. <laughs> I don't think they're still sitting there today. So, But I'm, I'm looking at the scene. I'm like, why? Like, what is going on here? And to be honest, it, it, there was something almost chilling about it. There, there was something almost like, wow, is this, is this who we are? 
Is this in all of us? Like, is there something in our humanity, in our flesh, where maybe we would say, like, well, I wouldn't do that, but, you know, we've been in other situations where the person wants to cut in on traffic, like, there's no way I'm giving up the 0.5 of a second I would lose to let you into the land, right? Like all of us, right? I think it, it was chilling to me because it revealed something in me, something in me and in all of us that, that plays itself out in really trivial ways like pick up time at school, but it actually plays itself out in really graphic, horrific ways as well. Like the nation of Russia just deciding, like I'm, we're coming into the Ukraine. Right? It plays itself out. And it's, this, it's this thing in us that says, like, in order for me to win, someone else has to lose. And that for me to maintain my own sense of satisfaction or happiness or fulfillment or whatever it is, if I have to push down someone else to get ahead, then that's what I'm going to do, right? If I, if, if I have to kind of get my elbows out to, to, to make sure I'm, there's a way for me, then that's what I'm going to do, right? The truth of the matter is, in the flesh, all of us have the potential to be the driver at the front of that line, right? We might say we don't, but put in the right circumstances, we do. There is something in us that says, you know what, I just want to win, I just want to get ahead, and that's what it means to be successful. And, and guys, I, I, I say that to kind of point out the fact that Israel, they didn't want a donkey riding Jesus. They wanted a white war horse riding Jesus, right? They wanted someone who was going to help them win, who was going to get them ahead, who was going to increase their lot in life. That's what they wanted. But the truth is, in Luke chapter 19, when Jesus weeps over the situation, he doesn't just weep for them. He weeps for us, doesn't he? He weeps because he knows that Jesus has come to establish a different way and a different order and a whole different metric of what it means to live and love, what even winning means in the kingdom of heaven is different than in the kingdom of this earth. And he weeps for us because he knows that in our flesh we won't receive it. (laughs) And that we will inflict generation upon generation upon generation of pain upon ourselves, rejecting the way of Jesus and embracing the way of the flesh. And Jesus weeps. There's a moment um, where Jesus speaks to this reality just a little bit later on, you know, as he continues this journey to the cross. Just a few days later, Jesus and his disciples, they find themselves in the garden, right? You know this story, Matthew 26. And Judas, by this stage, has has betrayed Jesus, and the crowd shows up, and they've got swords, and they've got clubs. The, The atmosphere is very different in the garden than it was on the road to Jerusalem, isn't it? And they're going to arrest Jesus when, well, Peter's there, and, and Peter's, he's like, okay, this is what we trained for, let's go. He pulls out his sword, and he takes a swing with his sword, which depending on which way you look at it, it's either one of the worst or one of the best swings of a sword in human history. <laughs> what was Peter aiming for? I guess we'll ask him one day in heaven. <laughs> But he chops off the ear of a guard, and, and Jesus very quickly interjects, and he's, he's like, no, 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 this is not how this is going down. He heals the guard. And then Jesus says something um, really profound. And it's one of those things that Jesus says. You know how there's a lot of things Jesus says that the world, we use in culture, we use kind of in everyday language, but not everyone realizes that Jesus was the one who said it. I feel like there's quite a few of those things around. But Jesus said this. He said, he, said, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. The one who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And when Jesus says that, right, it's this, it's this prophetic 
word, this prophetic insight that is not just about that moment, right? It's, it's a word that cuts back into history. It's a word that cuts forward into the future. It's a word that speaks to us a day. It's a word that echoes and rings true to us, even as we turn on the news and see what is happening in our world today. Because the truth of the matter is, if that is history has shown us anything, history has shown us that the world is not short of rulers, leaders, emperors, presidents, dictators who want to live by the sword, right? And that the world has taught us that the way to get ahead is to leverage your power, use your power, push other people down if that's what you need to do. I mean, we have generations of history where this has been true, right? The way to get ahead is to use your power. And the, the irony of it, of course, is Jesus, very nonchalantly in that whole situation, says, and, and by the way, this is my paraphrase, but by the way, I'm actually more powerful than anyone here. He says, I could send down 12 legions of angels, and uh, you know, that would make your, your armies kind of look like little toy soldiers. So just so you know, I am the most powerful here. But Jesus is reminding us, he says, but those who live by the sword... They will die by the sword. Because the truth is, the sword will only breed more swords. And that your violence will only breed more violence. And that your revenge will only breed more revenge. Jesus is pointing to a different way. And he's saying, guys, you need to recognize that ultimately the world is not going to be won by the sword. The world will be won by self-sacrificing love. And that I didn't come to rule by the sword. I came to rule in a whole different way. And so the words of Jesus are prophetic right there when he says those who live by the sword and those who die will die by the sword. But guys, I want us to not miss that when Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, it is also a prophetic act, right? It is Jesus saying without question that I have not come to dominate my enemies. I have come to die for my enemies, I've come to die for my enemies. And guys, this is why we need to recognize that even though there have been a lot of kings in history, it is only Jesus who is the king of kings. There have been a lot of men and women with a vision, a, a grand sense of destiny to establish an emperor, to establish a kingdom. You turn on cable news right now, we have a vivid display of it right in front of us, right? A lot of people with this grand sense of destiny to rule by might, to rule by power, and all of them, from dust they came and to dust they returned. They may have been kings in their day, but only Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Only his name is worthy to be worshipped because he is the only one who didn't bow to the cycle of violence and revenge and power. He actually broke the cycle. He took all of the violence and all of the hatred and all of the evil upon himself. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. And the Bible says he made a public spectacle of it, destroying and defeating the cycle once and for all. He showed us the different way, a new way, the way of peace and grace. He led us not just in the way of the lion, but in the way of the lamb. Friends, we worship the king of kings. A name that is above every name. The Philippians 2 says, the father has elevated him to the right hand. He did not consider equality be with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. This is our king. This is our Lord. We do not worship a white horse warrior God. We worship the God who rides the donkey. And we are called to follow in the way of the donkey riding king to show the world what it means to actually lay down our lives for those we love and to lay down our lives even for those who hate us. I'll finish with this quote. I think this quote is so profound. Uh, it captures what I'm talking about today from A.W. Tozer. 
And Tozer said it this way. He said, if man had his way, the plan of redemption would be an endless and bloody conflict. In reality, salvation was bought not by Jesus' fist, but by his nail-pierced hands. Not by muscle, but by love. Not by vengeance, but by forgiveness. Not by force, but by sacrifice. Jesus Christ, our Lord, surrendered in order that he might win. He destroyed his enemies by dying for them, and he conquered death by allowing death to conquer him. (laughs) Isn't that good news? He conquered death by allowing death to conquer him. Guys, we have a whole history of white horse riding kings. And yet, as the people of the Lamb, we give our lives to the donkey riding king. The one who didn't just enter in and perpetuate the cycle, he came and he broke it forever. And he showed us a different way. And so we follow the way of the Lamb. And it needs to play itself out in how we love our families and how we love our church and how we love our neighbors and how we find ourselves on the street where the tractor trailer wants to come down and we can either move or we can stand our ground. We know there is a better way. There is a higher way. But you know what? It doesn't just play itself out in how we love those who love us. It is actually more displayed in how we love those who hate us. And those we disagree with and those we find ourselves on the other side of the political spectrum, whatever that might be. On those we can't see eye to eye. The the way of the Lamb is a costly and a difficult path, but is the invitation for all of those who call Jesus Lord. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. And so Jesus, we bless you. And we thank you for the way of the Lamb. God, we thank you for the donkey riding king. We thank you that you did not come just as another king on another horse with another sword. You came with a whole different kingdom. And a whole different view of what power should even look like. And God, I pray that 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 vision, that image would not just remain a, a story in history. But God, it would be something that impacts our every day how we live our lives, how we love those around us. God, I pray it would permeate. And God, as we partner with you in the way of the Lamb, as we partner with you in loving people with that self-sacrificing love, Father, we would see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We would see your way established in our schools, in our cities, in our neighborhoods. And people would see us And they would say, there is something different about them. There's a a different rule, a different mindset, a different economy. May we be known as your people. In Jesus' name, amen.